Good afternoon, everybody. I'd like to uh, welcome everybody to the University of the West of Scotland and this inaugural lecture by Professor Milan Radosadlovic. So, Radosadlovic. Already an existing member of Disclosure Scotland. Excellent. Milan graduated in civil engineering at the University of Maribor near the Austrian border in Slovenia and got uh, to the UK in 1995 as an exchange student at the University of Dundee, where he completed his PhD in 2003 under the supervision of Professor Malcolm Horner within the Construction Management Research Unit, CMRU. Uh, Malcolm, I believe you're in the audience, you're very welcome. Uh, and where Milan later took a post as a teaching assistant. Now, during this time, due to his baking skills, we're learning things tonight, he's become well known for his unique meringue pie. I've not experienced that yet, Milan. He has asked me to confess that once when he produced uh, 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 one of these pies at Dundee, he accidentally used fish tasting breadcrumbs as an ingredient for the weekly CMRU week uh, Wednesday cake contribution. So uh, for those of you who may have been feeling unwell after that, that may be the explanation. Now, Milan joined UWS in December 2013 as Professor in Civil Engineering before being appointed to the position of Assistant Dean Research and Enterprise in the School of Computing and Engineering as it was at the time, now Computing, Engineering and Physical Sciences. That was in September 2014. And he held the post of Associate Vice Principal Research and Enterprise between September 2017 and May 2020 when following uh, an international recruitment process, he was then appointed to his current executive role, Vice Principal and Pro Vice Chancellor, Research, Innovation and Engagement. Now I'm reliably told that when Milan came to his interview for his first job here at UWS in 2013, he got lost and he accidentally stumbled on our artist in residence, Professor Sandy Stoddart, who is the Queen's Sculptor in Ordinary. And I believe it was a as a consequence of that interaction, that he decided UWS was the place to work. In, Milan, in the past, Milan has held leadership positions across multiple areas of academic activity, including teaching and learning, enterprise, in addition to several program leadership and course development roles. He also has several years of leadership experience in the off-site construction sector in Slovenia, and over the years has been a regular keynote or invited speaker at international industry project management conferences for the energy and construction sectors. He's a proud father of two children, daughter Marusha, 18, and son Oliver, and his husband to wife Dominika. And he notes that these are his rocks and best critics. As some of you know, he's also a keen cyclist and is grateful to UWS that his Paisley office provides him with one of the best cycle commutes to work possible. Now, I understand there are a few members of his family present. Uh, Dominika, his wife, is here this evening, as his son Oliver. His sister, Liliana, is also present, and I believe that she is hosting Milan's parents who are being uh, supported in their technological needs in Slovenia by his sister. There's a number of other friends in attendance tonight from his past, uh, Professor Samo Lube, supervisor from Maribor, the CMRU gang, I believe, are here. Uh, uh, Professor Bobby Mikowski, who was a colleague at Dundee, but in a different research unit, and he now works at GCU. I'm not sure why we're mentioning GCU. And of course, one of his high school friends, Gorazad Kupan, who he cycled along the Adriatic coast with. Well, as well as everybody else who's here to enjoy your lecture tonight and wants to hear about complexity, black swans, and anti-fragility, if I can ask everybody to turn their microphones off, it's over to you, Milan. Uh, thank you, Craig. Um, I'll share the screen first and uh, then I'll uh, begin. Right, I'll, uh, good afternoon, and I'll start with a story first, and uh, you, could, you could have imagined, you know, being the STEM academic, uh, I'll first hit you with, with numbers, with a couple of numbers, but actually these two uh, figures here are, are, are mon of monumental importance uh, for our day-to-day -day life. Um, the story was, uh, is actually dates back to 1961. Yes, yeah, so it's not the story that includes me, by the way, I wasn't even born at the time. Um, at MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, where uh, uh, an academic was working with on the weather forecasting computer model. 
And uh, one of the things that he did during that period of time was basically uh, trying to work on the, uh, trying to basically progress the work of uh, no other than Louis Fry Richardson. And for everyone who knows Louis Fry uh, Richardson, he was one of the principals at the Basel Technical College, you know, many, many years ago. So, you know, it's a small world. What this academic, Professor Edward Lawrence, did at the time was that, uh, uh, you know, the computers in the 1960s were not like the computers today. And you had to basically rerun the operation several times over. Uh, very often, you, uh, you, you also kind of had to cool the computers down because otherwise they would be overheating and all the rest. But in that particular case, in one particular sequence, he was studying a sequence of weather, simulated weather over a, over a period of several months. So that means several data points and he stopped one of the machines, he restarted then another machine and basically punched in the numbers uh, into the new machine in order to kind of repeat the sequence that he has already run on, on, on another machine. The difference of course was that um, what he did was he punched in the numbers that you see below, so 0 0.506, whatever that, whatever that was uh, uh, as, a, as an entry point, rather than the six decimal points that the machine recorded on, on, on its system. The difference is minute. You're talking about four decimal places and, and you know, the rounding up is, is a normal process that we do on, on a day-to-day -day basis in engineering and, 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 and other areas as well. But in this particular case, it proved to be uh, really significant. What he noticed just after a few uh, data points uh, running the simulation is that there was a significant difference between the new run and the previous run. I mean, quite you know, stark significant difference. You were talking about, you were talking about the exponential uh, order of magnitude difference uh, uh, between the two, between the two runs. And uh, that particular discovery has actually been the pivotal in the, in the establishment of the new mathematical theory called chaos theory that is now being used uh, across the board and, 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 and in a variety of different, different uh, circumstances in a different discipline. So for example, we are using chaos theory in, in weather prediction. And I can almost, uh, you know, for certain uh, tell you that uh, weather predictions beyond one week because of the specific characteristics of chaotic systems is uh, not possible. But nevertheless, our, our current systems are actually pretty good. They're built on uh, the work that has been done by Edward Lawrence at the time, but also Lewis Fry Richardson. So, so it's, it, it's, it's interesting. And it's also interesting that actually the, the most accurate model currently in existence, the European Center for uh, medium, medium term weather forecasting is in Reading, which was one of the institutions, in, uh, close to one of the institutions that I, that I used to work before as well. Um, now, one of the things that, that, that you can see from this is that in the complex systems, and particularly in chaotic systems, which not, do not necessarily need to be specifically very, very complex, very minute differences can, uh, very minute differences in the initial conditions at, at a particular point in time can lead to, um, in this particular case, exponential divergence, but very often in real life, in, in, in society, in weather and all the rest, lead to catastrophic events. And it's not a lot that is needed uh, uh, to kind of achieve the catastrophic events. Uh, just for the matter of interest, um, you could say the same, for example, for, for the current pandemic, but I'll, I'll, I'll touch on that uh, later on as well, although I would not classify the current pandemic as something that is as unpredictable as the chaotic systems. Now, one of the things that, that, that is clear when you study deterministic chaotic systems is uh, deterministic in the sense that you, you have the equations behind them is that they are um, governed by the specific values uh, in the equations called the parameters. You can tweak the parameters and then uh, you know, that leads to different kind of behavior. And, and I promise the next slide is a little bit wonkish, but I promise is the only wonkish slide where you will see some kind of equations because it's one of those things that um, is, is, has always been at the forefront in terms of my interest in chaos theory. The so-called Henault attractor that was developed by Michel Henault, the, the, the French mathematician. And it's very clearly because it's a really simple system of two equations, sequential equations, where you can see very clearly the power of the two parameters, A and B, in this equation. Now, why I'm saying this, that there is very powerful. Well, the Heno a map, Heno attractor, becomes a strange attractor, the one that you see uh, on, on the screen, only in the value of A equals 1.4 and B equals 0 0.3. And in all other values can be a different kind of chaotic attractor or, or, or basically a sequential map or, or, or um, uh, 
uh, intermittent intermittent map. So it's only for this value that it that, that you get the, the the map that you see in front in front of you, and for nothing else. And whilst this is actually really interesting for mathematicians, you might actually wonder, you know, what what's that got to do with the real life? And uh, what you see, and what I hope that I'll be able to show you over the next few slides, is that in real life. Uh, although we don't know what the equations are or whether there are any kind of equations that, that could uh, depict what is actually happening in real life, um, there are also some parameters that you can tweak and actually turn something either in a catastrophe or even better into serendipitous uh, circumstances where a positive results uh, uh, occur or, or happen. So those events, all of those events that I'm talking about, whether they're positive or whether they are negative, they are called black swans, black swan event and uh, events. And, and, and that, that, that word, that phrase has been coined by um, um, uh, Nicholas, Nicholas Taleb, uh, who is the, the, a little bit of a maverick academic currently working in the United States. And he's, he's, he's written a lot around, around this. And basically what the black swans are, are the events that are highly unpredictable and leads to either catastrophic, catastrophic kind of consequences uh, for, for the system uh, or, or they lead to major discoveries. So for example, you know, a really uh, good example of the contrast between the positives and negatives is that the 1987 uh, um, uh, stock market crash is considered as a black swan event and so is the discovery of the penicillin when you look when you look back into the realm of discoveries but uh, for example speaking of the pandemic and i did mention the pandemic before our current pandemic is not a black swan event because it was perfectly predictable and it, it was predicted earlier on uh, in in the previous years considering the kind of the the, the, the life that we have, the dynamic life that we have with a lot of travel and uh, in some cases with a lot of practices that are not necessarily the best practices when it comes to the spread of the viruses and so on and so on. So uh, the pandemic for that matter is not um, um, the black swan event, but there's plenty of black swan events. And uh, one of the, uh, the, the, the kind of the, um, the examples that Taleb normally uses is uh, when he says, don't be a turkey. He's talking about the, <laughs> he's talking about the Thanksgiving in the United States. It, it's, 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 a major, it's a major holiday in, in the US. And basically, you know, it's a, it's a Thanksgiving turkey that they, that they have on, on that day. And, and of course, for, for, for a butcher, uh, Thanksgiving is not a black swan event, but for a turkey it is because there is no way the turkey can predict what will happen uh, just before the Thanksgiving dinner. But at the same time, you know, um, uh, there is, there is uh, uh, you know, the ca catastrophic consequence at the end of the day. So one of the advices that the Taleb normally gives to people is don't be a turkey. So one of the things, one of the things that, that I would like to do now is looking back at the 30 plus years of my life, um, uh, looking back at some of the events that have, uh, that have basically followed me through this, through this journey. And particularly in the early stages of this journey, these events have been uh, very often, I would kind of say non-planned, you know, it was just, uh, you know, I was young and I was doing what I thought was uh, right. Um, but then uh, particularly over the last 10 years, uh, I have basically got enough experience to start using this and to start act actually following this phenomenon and start using it to my to my advantage. And what I would like to do over the next few slides, and I promise there are no more equations on the on the following slides, is to kind of uh, uh, give you some stories that that depict you know how you can actually in real life address or how you can see the parameters that can be changed in in in, in your own uh, advantage. So the first story is um, related to the competition. So this was, uh, this was a physics competition, primary school physics competition many years ago, where the teams of two from primary schools would go to the capital city uh, of a country and compete. And they would have, you know, as, as a normal kind of thing for the, for the physics competitions, you would have a series of questions and you would have to answer the questions and, and, and so on and so on. And it was one particularly difficult question. Um, the groups were given boxes and in these boxes you had a series of the um, resistors connected as a, so a series, resistors connected as a series, okay? And the question was which of those three resistors is a thermistor? Thermistor is a, uh, is a thermal resistor, which basically means that it resistance depends on the temperature. So, you know, it becomes more resistance the more you increase the temperature and all the rest. 
Now, one of the things, okay, this is enough of the wonkishness in this, in this particular case, but there's no equation, by the way. Uh, one of the things that was uh, peculiar about one particular team was that, that, that within the, the team of two uh, uh, pupils, one of them was to later become a professor in physics. So he was the, even at that time, you know, uh, had a proper knowledge of, uh, although early stage, you know, you're talking about primary school, but really good knowledge of physics uh, at the time. And one of them was a, a, a slight maverick. He didn't really uh, know a lot about the physics. Nevertheless, the combination proved to be really fruitful because what they, what they didn't have in terms of the knowledge about the, the particular problem at hand, uh, they compensated with a little bit of naughtiness. Uh, so one of the things that came to their mind was that, um, well, uh, if, if the three resistors in the box, and you can't open the box to look which one is the thermistor, are there and there is a series, then basically by increasing the current in this, in this particular circuit, uh, the resistors will, with increased current, increase in the temperature and eventually they will burn down, whilst the thermistor will not, or at least, you know, it will not burn first. Now, uh, that is a, 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 bit, a bit of a dangerous game, but nevertheless, it paid, it, it paid off. I mean, one of the thinking was that if the, if the two resistors were at the edges of the box, as you can see, you know, the, the question marks of the box, if they were at the edges of the box, then basically the smoke that would come out of the burning resistors would come very early on, uh, at the, you know, on the sides of the box, and they would come simultaneously at the same at the same time so you could then actually deduct from that that the middle the middle one was a thermistor and that's precisely what happened so it was the middle one that was the thermistor uh, and and an even even better um, outcome was when uh, the 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 panel who was overseeing the competition kind of in horror not noticed the smoke in the room they opened the box and 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 uh, basically the two the two pupils could could even see, you know, that one of the non-burned resistors in the middle was the thermistor, and they were the only ones who could uh, who were able to answer uh, the question correctly because then they reverse engineered it into the into the into the correct answer. Now, I would I would at that point say that you probably um, have uh, guessed by now who the non-physics uh, um, non-physics member uh, that lacked the knowledge of physics was in the in the in, in 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 one of those in one of those teams but it just shows you know what you can do if you basically change the parameters you know we, we the, the, the basically the teams were all faced with the same initial conditions they were all faced with the same problem uh, and, and sometimes, you know, the lack of knowledge in this particular case, you know, a lack of knowledge were forcing, you know, the team members to think slightly differently. And that's very often what you have to do in life as well. I'm not suggesting that you should burn something down in this particular case, but what I'm suggesting is that you have to look at the problem potentially, you know, at a different angle and then change the parameters and, and through this, uh, um, you know, turn the result to your, to your own advantage. That's the early example. Um, in, in, in my life that dates back to, to the primary school. The next example is uh, later on uh, from the ISDE. Uh, and, and actually, you know, just, just for anyone, there's a lot of people that wouldn't know what, what it stands for. It, it, it is, this is the International Organization, uh, International Association for the Exchange of Students for Technical Experience. And many years ago, when I was at, at the University of Maribor, I was the uh, president of the local committee for the ISD. And, and ISD is actually, you know, for anyone uh, who thinks that I myself am a black swan event for, <laughs> for being here uh, uh, today, you know, you can blame it on ISD because ISD is the reason why I'm today in Scotland. Um, I was an exchange student. And I remember the delegation uh, at the time uh, when they returned from the annual conference, I asked the annual conference in 1994 uh, in Mexico City. They told me, Milan, you wanted to go to a green country somewhere in the north of Europe as an exchange student. And I said, yeah. And they said, well, you wanted Ireland. We couldn't find you are anything in Ireland. But we find, we find, uh, we find a professor, you, you know, at Dundee University, Malcolm Horner. He, he's looking for a, for a trainee, you know, and, and it's, but he's in Scotland. I kind of thought to myself, Ireland green, Scotland green. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll do it. And uh, here I am uh, today as well. So, so it's, it's to be, you know, ISD is to be blamed for, for where I am right now. Um, but actually the, the major thing uh, and the major event that I remember 
uh, dates back to 1996, so, so two years later, where as, as, as a representative of the Slovenian delegation of IST at the annual conference in Copenhagen, and a friend of mine, Gregor Zupancic, who I also think is in the audience when the two of us attended this conference in Copenhagen. And um, for some reason, because it's basically through the fundraising and through a really kind of pretty uh, prolific uh, pestering of the local businesses in the times of uh, real economic hardship in Slovenia. Mind you, this was the time when Yugoslavia, former Yugoslavia, was amidst the, the, the civil war. So it was, there were difficult times for, for everyone. And in Slovenia, you know, getting traineeships, paid traineeships in businesses was not, was not easy. But what we managed to do is we managed to win so many that we were not, we were then scratching our heads, how the hell are we going to exchange them? So we basically said, look, we'll do our best. Uh, we know that there is an opportunity to kind of, you know, um, convince the countries, uh, uh, f you know, and the de other delegations during the evening events, uh, like like parties and and international dinners and all the rest, and 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 then look for the best. Now, what happened in, in, on day one is that uh, we were a little bit too proactive, you know, Gregor and I, and we kind of decided, okay, the first country that we're going to conquer and and ask for the offers is the United States. And, you know, you can see on this image, this is the image from 1972. This is, uh, so clearly I wasn't there because I was born in 1972, but that's roughly how it looks like. I mean, by the way, for everyone who knows me, the reason I don't have the image from 1996 is because of the fish corner effect. Uh, I don't remember where I placed my, my pictures from 1996 in which album, and I can't find the album. So Craig Thompson, I think you are in the, in the audience and you're laughing now uh, for what I'm saying, but there you go. So this is the replacement picture, but that's how it looks like. Basically you have tables dotted all over the very big place and it looks like a stock exchange where you have to convince one country has to convince another country accept the offer and exchange it for our offer and so on and so on. Now the big countries at that time they had a, a kind of a hidden agreement that um, basically they already exchanged the offers before the conference so they already knew okay you know I don't know Japan gets so many Germany gets so many and so and so on and so on and and Gregor and I were you know we were new to the to the game a little bit naive and we kind of we didn't know that so we said okay the first country we go to is the United States and then I remember the countries around us they were kind of going where the hell are you two going you know if you you don't go to the US, they don't exchange offers, you know, they have everything prearranged and all the rest. And we were kind of looking at, oh, forget about it. We are going to the US, we're going to exchange the offers no matter what. So we went to the US and they looked at us and they kind of said, but you know, we're not, you know, we're not exchanging any offers. And I, I kind of, we looked at them, but why are you here? I mean, you know, we want to exchange the offers and so on. And then I remember, vividly remember the guy, one of the, one of the delegations, one of the guys from the US delegations kind of taking the empty offer sheet and writing to be confirmed, to be confirmed under every line and gave us the empty offer sheet with to be confirmed on every line and said, well, if you want, you can take this offer. And uh, we felt a little bit insulted. We kind of said, sorry, we are not going to take that offer. And we turned them down. We really kind of said, you know, no way, we're not, we're not getting the offer. To which actually all the other countries, they were kind of saying, you know, oh my goodness, you're crazy. You know, you should have accepted that because eventually they, they will have to produce some kind of an, an offer behind it. And we said, no, I'm sorry, this is not the game we're playing. We were insulted in front of the rest of the world. I mean, imagine there was 80 plus countries in the, in the space and we were insulted. But let me tell you something. That's the best insult uh, I, I could possibly get at the time because it infuriated us. It infuriated us to the degree that we then said, okay, now we're going to show them what we can do. And we decided, the whole delegation, Slovenian delegation, we said, look, we are not going to come back to Slovenia with empty offers, with not exchanged offers. We cannot, we cannot give things up. You know, we have to uh, uh, bring back offers for our students so they can travel. So we said, okay, what we need to do is we need to go on a charm offensive. So we did go to, on a charm offensive. We basically had, uh, um, and, and Craig would be pleased, I mean, we did really good, good fundraising at the time and we raised thousands, thousands of pounds equivalent of, of, of money. We then went, Gregor and I went on a tour around Copenhagen to find a suitable bar. 
And we found a suitable bar and um, to our surprise, we found out that it was managed by a Macedonian. So we spoke the common language and we kind of, you know, agreed, okay, we'll bring the few delegations in here and uh, we'll, we'll pay the drinks. You know, you need to kind of help us to kind of look like a big event. And, you know, we're going to, you know, we're going on a charm offensive. You have to help us. He said, no problem. And uh, we said the easiest, I mean, the easiest, not the, really the easiest job, but you know, the first few countries that we have to target will be the Scandinavians, okay? Well, because if we win over the Scandinavians, we'll be able to win over others. I mean, it's all to do with basically making sure that you convince the delegations from other countries that it's worthwhile sending students to your country um, uh, to stay and, and have, a, have a good experience. And so we did. So on, on, on the first night, we basically brought in the, the Scandinavian delegations. We took them to that bar and we hosted them. We basically paid all the drinks. Mind you, this was Copenhagen, okay? Denmark is not known to be one of the cheap countries. And they were absolutely gobsmacked because they couldn't believe. They were basically saying, look, Slovenia, you, you know, former Yugoslavia is in the middle of the war. How, how the hell can you afford this? And of course, we were like, sorry, you have to come to Slovenia, you know, we are, we are a very hospitable country, we are, you know, we, we don't worry, there's no problem here at all, and, and, and all the rest, and we convinced them, and, and actually the next day we exchanged a huge number of offers on that basis, and, and raised the interest, but then nevertheless we still couldn't get through some of the really large countries, uh, and, and, you know, we were absolutely adamant, we we're going to exchange all the offers, so the next day, the next evening, we had the international dinner event. Now, how that looks like is, again, you have 80 countries, 80 plus countries, and they have stalls. And these stalls have, um, you know, cooked dishes, cooked, uh, you know, drinks and all the rest that are representative of your country. So you bring them on and then you're trying to kind of, you know, promote your country. It's a promotional event and all the rest and, uh, and try to convince them that, that, that basically it's worthwhile sending the students to you as well. And we did go on the charm defensive. This time we focused on the Far East and uh, we found out that, 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 that actually the two professors um, who represented uh, South Korea and Japan really liked our, our, um, our prosciutto, Slovenian prosciutto and, and, and wine and, and, and kind of, um, you know, it was, it was a little bit of serendipitous uh, event, I have to say, but they, they, they basically stayed at our stall almost the whole night. And, uh, uh, we did ask them in between, you know, are, are we, you know, are we going to exchange any offers and all the rest? And they said, you know, is this, is this how you eat? And, and is this how you live in Slovenia? We said, yeah, of course, you know, that's the, basically the food you get. That's, that's the hospitality you get and all the rest. They said, no problem, guys, we'll give you the offers. And the next day we exchanged all the offers. Now, that was the last day. One of the major events that happens on the last day is that the big countries who pre-arrange the exchanges beforehand then actually execute them. They basically give <laughs> each other the offers and, and, and uh, uh, the, rest, uh, the, the, the rest happens and, and the rest of us are actually around and watching what is happening. And, and that to me was, I mean, it really stayed in my memory because one of those was the Japanese delegation sitting with the American delegation exchanging the offers whilst the American delegations up, uh, delegation absolutely expected that what will happen is we give you our pack, Japanese give, give us your pack and that's it. What in reality happened was that the Japanese professor went through the offers from the United States and one by one turned down. He said no, 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 no. And actually, one of the reasons for this was that, of course, the Japan exchanged quite a number of offers with the Slovenian delegation uh, in the morning on, on that day. And it proves that even though that you're talking about the delegation from a really small country, a two million country, you know, if you have the right approach and you change the parameters uh, to negotiation, you can actually achieve the great result. And that's a black, that was a clear black swan event for the American delegation because they've never ever from that point onwards, at least as far as I know, exchanged offers as the traditionally they used to. And that means pre-arranged exchange because they were badly bitten uh, or badly, badly hurt basically by what happened on that last day. And even more, what happened afterwards was that they came to our table, they came to the Slovenian table uh, and they asked us whether we want to, whether we still want to exchange the offers. And we said, of course, you know, that this is why we, we came here. And, and for the first time, Slovenia then actually exchanged some of the offers with, with the United States. Um, and, and if memory serves me right, I do remember that one of the exchange offers was with one of now well-known companies that was a startup company uh, at the time. Uh, so that, that's just another, another uh, example like this, which, um, 
which demonstrates that if you look at the same thing with a slightly different angle, we change the parameters slightly, then actually you can achieve a, a great, great, great result, and it, it becomes it becomes a kind of the serendipitous, serendipitous uh, a, a black swan, uh, a positive outcome for for you. Now, now, from that point onwards, you know, I basically, you know, you know apart from the IST, I had to complete my studies. And, and, and again, uh, you know, one, one thing that I have to say is that, the, you know, in completing, in, in whatever I did during the, during the studies, I, I can't normally would take unusual steps in everything. And that actually happened also for my um, dissertation work. Uh, and, you know, I changed the parameters when it comes to study environment. Now, uh, please don't think that what, what I want to say here is that I use the Renault 4 as my study environment, as opposed to the a lecture room or, or, the, or the library or whatever else students were using at the time. That wasn't the case. It was that basically everyone at the time wanted to do the graduation, the, the, sorry, the dissertation project on something theoretical. And I didn't kind of want to do something theory. I want to do something practical. And I remember Samuel at the time, you know, and um, yeah, he's a good friend of mine still. And, and you know, he said, uh, I have a project for you. It's a renovation of the university hospital building in, in Maribor. And it's, you know, it's a, one of the, if it is not the tallest building in, in the city, uh, it's a major project. It would take a kind of longer than the normal uh, dissertation project, but you know what? I took it and you know why? I mean, it's not, not because of the, so much about the practicality. Samuel gave me the university car to drive around. I actually was able to pick up my specimens from the construction site with Renault 4. And let me tell you something, Renault 4 is a really wonderful car to drive. You know, it has the changing gear knob at the top and it's, it's, it's a phenomenal car to drive. But again, you know, uh, what I'm trying to emphasize here is you change the parameters. And what these change of parameters in this particular case resulted is that because I was doing something practical in my dissertation project and really practical, you're talking about, you know, me going on the construction site and, and doing the pull out test and checking, for example, the, you know, the, the, the repair uh, mortars uh, layers and so on. And then we did, I remember the um, xenon tests, you know, for, for the stability of the aluminum facade and the X-ray diffraction for, for, for that purpose as well and so on. So a lot of kind of, you know, very practical studies to help a real project. This was a real project and I, and I felt wonderful. But it also meant that later on, you know, when I graduated, I was the first in my group to get the employment because I was the only one being able to demonstrate, you know, practical experience directly from the uh, dissertation project. Um, and again, it's, it's all about, you know, you're doing the same dissertation, you have the same initial conditions, but you change the parameters slightly and you get a very, very different result. Now, up to this point, uh, all of these examples uh, were, uh, look, uh, my intuition, intuitively kind of following things and making decisions as I went along, there was nothing here was by design. I just kind of was, for example, in this particular case, would by, by, by the, by the you, know, you know, possibility of driving a car and having, you know, being the student, but still kind of having the company car and driving around. That, that's basically how I got in ties. But then when I started doing my PhD, um, this changed. Uh, it changed dramatically because I started understanding that there was someone who actually understood that you can create the environment in which serendipity becomes more probable. So that you don't have the bell-shaped curve probabilities anymore, but you have the fat tail curve probability. And that means that the extreme events, and in this particular case, obviously extreme events in terms of the serendipity, that means positive uh, um, outcomes, and, and the, 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 the fresh ideas and, the, and, and really kind of creative thinking can, can happen, you know, you can create environment that enables this to happen by design. And that's what happened when I joined the um, construction management research unit. Organizational parameters matter too. And I can see this now even more when I'm, when I'm working at UWS, but I'll, I'll talk about this later on. Um, I, I can't, I can't, you know, I, I'll try to use some words, you know, to de to depict, you know, what what I have gone through when I when I when I was at the CMRU. But it's it's to my knowledge, you know, today and and to, in my experience, is one of the best research uh, um, research units I have ever seen, ever been, uh, ever seen, ever witnessed in any institution uh, around the world. Uh, and it's down to chef de cuisine of the restaurant Serendipity, Professor Malcolm Horner, who is in the audience. Malcolm, thank you for for being. 
uh, here. Um, yeah, and, and all my friends within uh, CMRU, I mean, I, I hope that on these images, on these images that I, I have basically selected the images that all of the CMRU people are here. I kind of, I see Sasha Marinek, who I also think is, is in the audience. I can see uh, Folker is here, uh, Craig Thompson, Nanan Wang. I'm not sure whether Nanan managed to, to join in because she is at Dalian University. She's in Dalian in China and, uh, and, and, and kind of that's far away and it's in the middle of the night, I think, in, in, in Dalian. But if Nanan, if you're here, uh, thank you very much for joining. Now, now what, what this uh, research unit is, is, is basically what it was uh, under Malcolm, Malcolm's leadership. It was um, basically a melting pot of ideas, a really dynamic melting pot of ideas where we would debate, we would have Wednesday cakes and I would, uh, yeah, that, that was where I, I, have, I had this infamous uh, uh, meringue pie uh, incident and, and Craig knows uh, very well about this. Craig Thompson knows very well about this because he, I, I think Craig that you ate it actually. So, so yeah, good for you. Um, anyway, but, but there were some real, real kind of uh, interesting debates going on uh, left, right and center. There were sometimes the debates were so deep that actually we would be walking around with mugs um, being in front of the kettle, looking at each other and having absolutely no idea why we have reached the, uh, reached the kettle. You know, that's how deep the discussions were. And, and, and it showed that basically, you know, in the environment, in the enabling environment and the challenging environment, you can create uh, 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 the, such an environment and such co basically culture uh, that serendipity happens left, right and center. And that was, the, that was the, the basically the beautiful outcome of this. Now, I have to, I have to say, uh, Malcolm, with this as well, that uh, I'm very pleased that actually, you know, when I, look at, when I look at my current environment, you know, the executive where I'm a member of, uh, and, and also kind of the research and innovation team who I think are in the audience as well, um, we have uh, recreated what I have witnessed in CMRU and we have an absolutely wonderful, wonderful teams here, um, uh, numerous teams here who, who actually are recreating a, a, a really similar environment to what, what I have witnessed in the CMRU. But I cannot emphasize enough how important it is to create the right environment by changing just a few parameters and actually enabling people to kind of to, to, to flourish. Um, now, the last a uh, couple of slides um, um, that I have are, are basically linking all of this, what I said so far, with the purpose. Now, I could go on now and, and, and present further examples, uh, um, uh, you, you know, the examples for uh, with the, uh, the involvement, for example, in the London Olympics, where uh, one of those moments that happened during this time was when the ODA, the Olympic Delivery Authority, decided to ban the publishing of our report because apparently it was too damning. And this was just before the London Olympics started in 2012, uh, which then proved to be a wonderful decision because it led to Chartered Institute of building, uh, converting our report and publishing it as the first code of practice for program management uh, in, in the world. Um, but nevertheless, it was, it was an interesting time. Uh, you know, if you're kind of thinking for all the colleagues who are thinking about the non-disclosure agreements and, and how, how challenging and difficult sometimes they are, let me tell you, the ODA non-disclosure agreement for the London Olympics 2012 was on 64 pages. Um, I haven't even read it, but I signed, uh, I signed it, obviously, uh, and, and, and the requirement, the key requirement of this NDA was that you're not allowed to talk about the Olympics and your involvement in the Olympics up until the end of Olympics, no matter what. And, and we kept to this, uh, obviously. And I could, I could talk about more of the stories like this, but actually what I want to say is that particularly the last 10, 10 years, uh, the stories and, and whatever has been happening over the past 10 years is, has less been a chance and it's, it's more been uh, uh, by design. And, um, and when I looked at, for example, the achievements that we have had at UWS over the past few years. One of the things that really kind of looking at these images and looking at the academic colleagues who are behind them, um, you know, just uh, the, the sheer notion of being involved in these projects or basically being there for my academic colleagues, but also by, uh, for, for the businesses who, who, who are behind these projects and supporting them uh, it to me is, is, is one of the 
major kind of not just achievements but satisfactions that I have with my current job. Um, you know, I'm, I'm really genuinely enjoying my job because I can see, you know, how support for colleagues and support for for, for these projects is leading to the to the great successes that um, that we've had. And I'm kind of trying to trying to monitor uh, monitor what what Johnny Moan is just sending me from the um, from the knowledge exchange awards because I told them, you know, regardless of my um, of my lecture, you need to update me on basically where we are with the knowledge exchange awards. So 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 Craig and uh, the colleagues and everyone. Um, yes, we have just won the KTP Associate won the Knowledge Exchange Award for Innovator of the Future for the Finnish Instinct Wheelchair Project. It's the first win for UWS. So just to keep you updated, that, that actually that is uh, you know bringing another smile to my to my life, um, sorry to, to to my face. And gen, gen, generally, the purpose for me is look, I will keep searching for and adjusting parameters. Uh, in whatever kind of um, uh, um, activity uh, I'm involved in or, or I'm leading, uh, whether that is the CPD activity, research and supporting research, supporting innovation, uh, I'll keep searching for the parameters and adjusting them so I can stay happy. And that, that to me is the main purpose. I, can I, I want to be happy by being happy for you, for our people and with our people. And uh, with this, what I, what I want to say is this, this does not, you know, it clearly involves in terms of my professional life, involves, involves um, uh, my professional colleagues, but it also involves um, the, wider, the wider society and the wider kind of the, the stakeholders that are working, that are working with, uh, with our institution and, and with me directly. And it couldn't be, you know, the slogan, dream, believe, achieve, couldn't be better uh, underpinning that. And Craig, by the way, yes, it was. I mean, uh, Sun Distorted Studio was one of the reasons why I wanted to stay at, at UWS, simply because when I looked at the studio, I kind of said, there is something about an institution that um, houses, uh, you know, such a prominent sculptor uh, in, in, within the institution. Something has to be here. You know, there is something, something peculiar and something really interesting. And this was one of the defining factors. But it was also the kind of the messages that were sent from the UWS that, that, that really resonated with me. And there is no other message that resonates with me better than dream, believe, achieve. I mean, it's such a simple uh, sequence of words that really clearly depict what, you know, what, what my thinking is about what keeps me happy and what actually makes me get up every morning, get on my bike and, and, and get to work. Uh, because I want to be dreaming with, with, with my colleagues. I want to believe in, in their work and then achieve great results like the one that we just uh, won. But there is another group that is really important um, in my life and, and that I haven't actually mentioned uh, right now, but I, I left it intentionally right at the beginning, uh, right at the end, because, it's, it, it, because of its important, importance. And that is my family. Uh, without my family, I wouldn't have uh, been where I am, to be perfectly honest. And this journey would would look very different. And obviously, you know, for everyone, um, for each individual, a family can mean a different thing. Uh, it's your closed ones. And to, to me, the closed ones are my family and they are everything to me. You know, uh, I hope, I mean, I can't see now on the screen. I hope that my sister managed to to connect and, and, and that my parents are, are, are with us uh, now. But... Uh, yeah, my family is everything. I mean, you know, they are my rocks, um, and uh, and I can't wait to I can't wait to see them. Hopefully this summer, because otherwise, you know, it'll be more than two years this summer since the last time I have I have been uh, we have been in, in Slovenia. But um, yeah, that's 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 basically one of the defining factors of success, I would say. And uh, you know, it, it, when it comes to families, one thing that <laughs> that I, I would need to say is that if anyone has watched the Greek wedding movies uh, and uh, thinking about the the families you know our family is a is a, what we call a typical Balkan family but I would say you know we're we're loud we are full of love uh, we are full of uh, full of uh, dynamism and, and and so on and uh, as I said I look forward to seeing them uh, as soon as as soon as possible so again I'll just repeat I'll be searching for and adjusting the parameters so I can stay happy by being happy for you and with you. Uh, and that, that includes all, all of my colleagues and my, and my family as well. So the final message to you is, what are your parameters? Thank you.
Well, Anne, thank you very much. Uh, what a lovely presentation and uh, delighted to see that you can actually act as a news reader while also giving a presentation and bring us uh, some of the latest news. Uh, delightful to get up uh, to get that uh, KTP insight that you referred to during the presentation that uh, the wheelchair project we're involved in uh, has won another award um, and we know that it'll win many awards. Uh, that's a fantastic project and you and colleagues involved in that should feel very proud. Uh, what a wonderful presentation. Uh, there's a few questions that have come in and I'll just sort of try and work my way through some of those. Um, uh, one of the questions submitted earlier was, uh, how does your love of cycling influence your thinking? It's a reset. Um, uh, uh, first of all, it's a good question. It's a reset. Basically, what you need every here in a while, and that's basically the role of the holidays as well, I think, every here in a while, is that you need to reset. You're in, you know, when, you, when you're working hard and when you're working in, in kind of, and you're really passionate about some of the things, you get it very often into automatic mode. And, and on a day-to-day -day basis, you know, Craig, you know, you go from meetings to meetings and all the rest, and sometimes you're in automatic mode and, 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 and so on. And when I'm on my bike, I basically switch off completely. And the only thing that, that matter are my bike, the nature around me, and, 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 and my mind empties for at least, you know, half an hour. Uh, uh, and, and that's a really, really important thing, you know, if you want to then recharge yourself to continue with the same level of dynamism next time. Sounds good. And I'm sure all the punctures that you get too add to that, uh, that ability to think clearly. Um, <laughs> the, the, another question here is, are black swan events ultimately always unpredictable, unmodelable? And does philosophy have as much to offer as STEM in moving forward a flexible university and economy? The, the first one, the, the black swans are by definition unpredictable. With the benefit of the hindsight, you can look back and you can make the connection to the to the original point and why that happened. But actually, at the time when you are in the right time, sorry, if you're looking at right now, at, you know, in a point in time, you cannot predict uh, the black swans. They're inherently unpredictable. But in the hindsight, you can actually say, you know, it's almost like, uh, you know, the generals after, after, the, after the battle. It's basically, you can, you can look back and say, oh yeah, that, that is obvious. But actually right now it's not obvious and therefore they're unpredictable. When it comes to the, the second question, philosophy and, and, and STEM, I kind of think, you know, one of the major contributions that the philosophy has given to the society is that it's not about being right or wrong. It's not about having an answer. It's not about this constructivism and the per paradigms that are normally underpinning the STEM subjects where you have positivism and constructivism. So basically you have cause and effect and all the rest. Philosophy doesn't have that. Philosophy is constant questioning of everything in my, in my mind. And that, that is really, really important. As an engineer, I'm telling you, the engineers have one major flaw that they constantly look for solutions. And sometimes it is not about the solutions. It is about questioning the paradigms that are existing, but not necessarily uh, offering any kind of solutions. And, and of course, that's one of the rich values of university uh, education, research and teaching that we, we're constantly here to question and be questioned and, and to have to rationalize and justify our thinking. So, so um, another question has come in that in this volatile, uncertain, complex and ambiguous world, um, how can we handle the state of economy in this chaos and black swan events occurring in the economy point of view? I'll let you interpret that. All right. If I had, if I had the answer to that, one thing is that you constantly, I mean, because it's unpredictable what will happen in the future, we live in a really complex times as well. You know, there's all sorts of kind of, you know, multipolarities in terms of the world politics and so on. So it's really difficult to predict. It's basically being constantly vigilant and constantly prepared for the worse. And, and when I look at, um, you know, Craig, you would know that uh, obviously because, of, because, you know, it's your executive group, but, you know, that's basically how we operate within the executive group. We're not letting things go. We're constantly kind of being vigilant and we are not letting any kind of, even the, you know, the positive results kind of clouding our, 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 our view because we know that we live in such an uncertain time that we have to constantly be kind of on the lookout for new opportunities and not sleep on the laurels. You know, the worst case scenario is that you sleep on the laurels and you say, look, we're doing all right currently. We don't need to actually, no, you have to constantly look for the new opportunities constantly look for the changing of the parameters so that you create favorable conditions for yourself. 
Okay, uh, well, we're staying with black swans for a minute. So, so could superposition in quantum computing promote serendipity oriented black swans in our places and spaces? You can thank Gordon Mitchell for that one. <laughs> oh, Gordon, thank you. You put me on the spot right now here. Well, what, what I think is, is, I don't think that there is so much, Gordon, the question of the supercomputing as it is the question of artificial intelligence. And, and one, one, of the, one of the major issues that I have with artificial intelligence is that actually currently, when you look at the developments of artificial intelligence, you will, you'll realize that actually it's less artificial than it is human. And that to me is fundamentally the problem. In the purest sense, artificial intelligence has no um, kind of um, 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 qualms with the humanity because they exist in a different, in a different world. Uh, but in, you know, the problem with AI currently is that it's under, under control of the humans. So it's not really artificial intelligence. And when you have something that is under control of the, of the humans, it means that you have the human interests that may prevail. And that means that basically what you can get is the artificial intelligence being used or misused for the wrong purposes. So whilst the supercomputing can actually give you the power, it depends on how you use that power. You know, like with everything else, it, it, it's, up, it's up to the humans. And if, if we use it for the wrong reasons, then basically it, it, it may lead to bad results, not necessarily positive results. Sure. Okay. So how can we routinely change parameters when we live in an overregulated world? What needs to happen for everyone to feel comfortable with uncertainty? And is there a formula for helping people to see that uncertainty is good? There is no formula. The uncertainty has to be accepted. And, and the sooner you accept it, the easier it will be to let it go, to kind of just say the uncertainty is here and you do not actually try to change this because, because you can't, fundamentally you can't. When it comes to the looking for the, for the parameters and the overregulation, look, when you look at the, what is being regulated and how is being regulated, and you look at the history of the regulation, you will always see that it is always possible to find a way of how regulation can be adjusted as well. So, you know, saying that something is overregulated, but doing nothing about it, or at least not looking at it from, from a different angle, um, it's to me insufficient. You have to kind of uh, look at the regulation and constantly ask yourself, you know, is there something or is there a particular angle that you can take to change the regulation? Okay. Uh, just, just picking up uh, on the, the philosophy question I asked you a moment ago, your, your colleague Jonathan Powell has made a couple of comments saying that um, black swans are very familiar to Australians, they trip over them every night, and that serendipity you've just been talking about is something that he'll be picking up in his inaugural lecture next week when he brings together the concept of philosophy and humanities working with STEM to, uh, to improve society and university. But back to another question here, does a can-do attitude help you see opportunity rather than problem during chaos? Can-do, I mean, yes. I mean, you know, the can-do attitude has to be the attitude that, that is, Okay, there's a English, English uh, the, the, the challenge with the English, um, how would you call that, the, the semantics here, with the semantics, because can do uh, entails action. What I'm more proponent of is open-mindedness, and that does not entail action. So can do means, okay, right, okay, no matter what challenge you have, you will always find the solution. You remember what I said about the solutions. Sometimes it's not good to have the solution. Sometimes, for example, you know, in communication, we know that silence is actually, um, you know, really loud communication sometimes. And, and it's the same with action. Non-action sometimes is stronger than, than, than the action. But it's open-mindedness that is really important. Being open-minded to the, to the new questions, to the new angles, to the new ideas is, I think, more important than the can-do that entails action. Okay, that's good. Yeah, now, you talked about setting the parameters uh, for success and the importance of knowing your own worth in negotiations. What would be your top tips for young academics, early career researchers to maximize the number and quality of their opportunities? It, again, it's open mindedness. You know, I remember one of the things that, that, that really resonated with me from the, from the Lucy's presentation. And, and I, I kind of remember that, that, that Lucy got a question of, you know, um, 
you know, I don't remember the question, but I remember her, her answer. And she was said, she said, be open to opportunities. When the opportunities come your way, grab them. And that's basically what you have to, what you have to do. And I kind of, you know, sometimes I see the, the, the academics as well as the students, they kind of go, okay, there is an event or there is a, there is something the university organizes, but it's not my area. Okay. And they said, it's not my area. I'm not going. My approach always has been, it's not my area. I'm really interested in because it's not my area. If it is my area, I know what's going on, but if it is not my area, I'm interested in different angles. So again, being open-minded, open-minded to different angles can actually help you shape your own area much better. Milan, we've covered a bit of uh, ground tonight. Uh, you've given us an insight into your life, your, your learning journey, your academic experience and your family. And we know that many of your family members are here with us tonight as well. Uh, there's a lot of positive comments uh, in the chat line. I won't go through them all, but if, um, if Alison or Rebecca can save a copy of that file, please, so that Milan can read those comments and who they're from later. There's some, there's some enormous love there for you. <laughs> and, and, and we all know the personality that you have as a, a genuinely interested person. You give people time and respect, and you're always keen to help people develop and, and advance their own knowledge and careers. Uh, and, and most recently, of course, you've been the central point and contact for me to ensure that our REF 2021 submission went forward in an appropriate way. Profile in the university and all the great research work that colleagues have done across the past seven years in the best possible light for the submission that we've, uh, that we've made and the outcome that will uh, hopefully come from that when we find out in a year's time. So listen, uh, Milan, on behalf of my colleagues, everybody here present tonight, we want to thank you for the thought provoking inaugural lecture you've given. I uh, wish you every success uh, in the continuation of your career. You're a youngster by, by many standards of us, uh, those of us here tonight. Uh, so, so there's plenty yet to be achieved and we look forward to working with you on that journey.